Thanks for tuning in again this week, ladies and gentlemen, as we continue our study of the seven feasts of Jehovah listed in Leviticus chapter 23. We have already discussed the three spring feasts, Passover, Unleavened Bread, and First Fruits, and one summer feast, Pentecost. They were associated with the early or former rain. Today we will discuss the fall feasts, which are related to the latter rain. The interval between the former and the latter rain represents the dispensation of grace, the time we are in right now. The Feast of Trumpets is the first of the fall feasts. Sometimes it is called Rosh Hashanah, which means the head of the year. According to tradition, Adam was created at the Feast of Trumpets. Stay tuned. Welcome to Understanding the End of the Age with Teresa Garcia. The world has entered into a time of paradigm shift when everything that can be shaken will be shaken. Signs and wonders, miracles and healings attest to this truth. It is the time of the coming of the Lord. Join Teresa as we discuss how to prepare our hearts and loved ones in understanding the end of the age. I'm Teresa Garcia. Thanks for joining me again this week as we continue in our series, The Moedim of Jehovah. You know, for three weeks we have been looking at the feasts fulfilled in relation to Jesus' first coming, and we have to ask ourselves the same question we've been asking why do we even have to take time to study the feasts? And the answer is because everything in the plan of salvation happens on one of these feasts. So if we want to understand the end times, we need to look at the unfulfilled feasts. Heavenly Father, we remember that you spoke to the prophet Jeremiah and you said this, the anger of the Lord will not turn back until he has satisfied and performed the thoughts of his heart. In the latter days, you will understand it perfectly. And we thank you, Lord, that we do understand better and better the end times now in the mighty and powerful name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. So we're going to be putting the feast back on the screen then as we look at the fall feasts. Let's take a look right now. The spring feast related to the barley harvest we have discussed. The summer feast Pentecost we have discussed. Today we are going to look at the first of the fall feasts which are related to the olive and, olive and grape harvest. It is the feast of trumpets or Rosh Hashanah. So let's look now. It is the beginning of the Jewish civil year. And if the information that is in red on your screen is in red for two reasons. First of all, because the events are still in the future. And secondly, because it is an educated guess. In other words, can we say absolutely we know when the Feast of Trumpets will be fulfilled, it will be on the rapture. No, we cannot say that. But I'll just tell you, this is what many people believe today. Um, but again, not for sure. Now, David Barron says that we have to be very careful in dealing with the unfulfilled feasts because we don't know exactly how it's all going to play out. And so we don't want to make this, thus saith the Lord. But before we talk about the Feast of Trumpets, there is one verse in Leviticus chapter 23 that David Barron says uh, is almost on a different subject. And he says it is not without significance. So let's go back to the word and look in Leviticus 23 at verse 22, which is a little bit off the subject of the feasts. When you reap the harvest of your land, you shall not wholly reap the corners of your field. When you reap, nor shall you gather any gleaning from your harvest. You shall leave them 
For the poor and for the stranger, I am the Lord your God. And so this admonition from Jehovah to leave something for the poor, the widow, the stranger illustrates God's deep love for the unsafe people and the Gentiles. Furthermore, the best fulfillment of this is in the book of Ruth. So if you know the story, Boaz allowed the widow Ruth to glean from his field. He ended up not only marrying Ruth, but they were in the lineage of the Lord Jesus Christ. So, Now let's listen as uh, Clarence Larkin talks about the interval. The interval is the time between the Feast of Pentecost in the summer and uh, the Feast of Trumpets in the fall. And it is roughly equivalent to what we're talking about as the church age. He says, Between the Feast of Pentecost and the Feast of Trumpets, There was an interval of four months during which the harvest and vintage were gathered in. There was no convocation of the people during those busy months. This long interval typifies the present dispensation in which the Holy Spirit is gathering out the elect of the church and during which Israel is scattered among the nations. When the present dispensation has run its course, and the fullness of the Gentiles has been gathered in, Romans 11.25, along with the remnant according to the election of grace of Israel, Romans 11.5, then the dispensation of grace will end. And that is essentially where we are right now. We are at the end of the dispensation of grace and we are waiting for the catching away of the church to meet the Lord in the air, which many scholars believe will be on the Feast of First Fruits. Let's listen to what it says in Leviticus about that feast. Then the Lord spoke to Moses saying, Speak to the children of Israel saying, In the seventh month, on the first day of the month, you shall have a Sabbath rest, a memorial of blowing of trumpets, a holy convocation. You shall do no customary work on it, and you shall offer an offering made by fire to the Lord. And so this is called Rosh Hashanah, the head of the year or Jewish civil new year, the first day of the civil year. According to Jewish tradition, Adam was created on this day, and many Christians believe this is when the church will be caught away to meet the Lord. Let's go to 1 Thessalonians for a few minutes. Before we read, keep in mind that this is the first letter that Paul ever wrote about the year 50 or 51 A.D., And he had taught the rapture doctrine to the church when he was in Thessalonica. Now he's left. They all believe Jesus would uh, catch them away during their lifetime. They started thinking about their relatives who loved Jesus who had gone home. And they wondered what would happen to them. Paul answers that in the first letter to the Thessalonians. But I do not want you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning those who have fallen asleep, meaning died, lest you sorrow as others who have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so God will bring with him those who sleep in Jesus. For this we say to you by the word of the Lord." Now, when Paul says, by the word of the Lord, he means revelation from heaven to Paul for the church. It is the equivalent of words spoken by Jesus. Now, let's listen. For this we say to you, by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord will by no means precede those who are asleep. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel, and with the trumpet of God. And the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive and remain 
shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and thus we shall always be with the Lord. Now notice in verse 16, there are three witnesses at the time of the catching away of the church. The shout of the Lord, the voice of the archangel, and the trumpet of God. Again, some say on the Feast of Trumpets. In the next chapter, chapter 5, uh, Paul tells them that the day of the Lord comes as a thief in the night. And I was listening to Dr. Billy Brim teach on chapter 5 one time, and she said something interesting. Watch the pronouns. So that's what we're going to do right now. We're going to watch the pronouns. When Paul says, you... He means the church. When he says we, he means himself and the church. And when he says they, it means the world. But concerning the times and the seasons, brethren, you, the church, have no need that I should write to you. For you yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord so comes as a thief in the night, For when they, the world, say, peace and safety, then sudden destruction comes upon them as labor pains upon a pregnant woman, and they shall not escape. But you, church, are not in darkness, so that this day should overtake you as a thief. You are all sons of light and sons of the day. We... Paul and the church are not of the night nor of darkness. For God did not appoint us to wrath, but to obtain salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ who died for us, that whether we wake or sleep, we should live together with him. Now, Clarence Larkin makes another point, which we're going to give. It's kind of off topic, but it's equally significant. Let's listen. If all the church are to pass through the tribulation, then instead of waiting and watching for the Lord, we should be waiting and watching for the tribulation, which is contrary to the teaching of Christ himself. The tribulation is not for the perfecting of the saints. It has nothing to do with the church. It is the time of Jacob's trouble. The book of Revelation is written in chronological order, After the fourth chapter, the church is no more seen upon the earth until she appears in the 19th chapter with the bridegroom from heaven. Now, after Paul wrote 1 Thessalonians, confusion entered into the infant church. The doctrine went out that the day of the Lord had already begun. And so we're going to listen in Tim LaHaye's Prophecy Bible for just a minute. Now, why did some believe that the day of the Lord had already begun? Either because a false prophet said it or wrote it, or because they were already suffering intense persecution. Therefore, Paul wrote 2 Thessalonians to clear it up. And by the way, this is just a couple months later, so we're still in the year 50 or 51 AD. Let's listen. Now, brethren, concerning the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our gathering together to him, we ask you not to be soon shaken in mind or troubled, either by spirit or by word or by letter, as if from us, as though the day of Christ had come. So they either had a spirit or a word or a letter that he said they should ignore. Continuing. Let no one deceive you by any means, for that day will not come unless the falling away comes first. Now, here's Tim LaHaye's point. The first seven English translations of the Word of God translate falling away as departure. Then in the King James, it was changed to the words uh, apostasy or... um, falling away. And so there's some who think it should read, let no one deceive you by any means for that day will not come unless the departure comes first. Others say it's until 
unless the apostasy of the church comes first. So maybe both. Now uh, let's address another topic from Paul. The next time Paul writes about the rapture is in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Now we are in about the year 56 AD. So about five years later, Paul says this, Behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed in a moment in the twinkling of an eye at the last trumpet. There we see a trumpet. For the trumpet will sound and the dead will be raised incorruptible and we shall be changed. Now this could be the last trumpet to sound on the Feast of Trumpets. Some Christians have believed in a mid-tribulation rapture because they think the last trumpet in 1 Corinthians 15 is talking about the seventh trumpet judgment in Revelation 10. This is highly unlikely. Let me explain why. We'll put it on the screen. The last trumpet in 1 Corinthians 15:52 is not the seventh trumpet in Revelation 10:7. 1 Corinthians 15. Behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet, was written in 56 AD. Whereas, Revelation 10, verse 7, But in the days of the sounding of the seventh angel, that is, the seventh trumpet, When he is about to sound, the mystery of God would be finished as he declared to his servants the prophets was not written until 95 A.D. So there's two problems with believing that these two verses represent the same event. First of all, since Paul wrote 1 Corinthians 15 in 56 A.D., his audience would have no knowledge of the seventh trumpet in Revelation 10, 7. The Lord wouldn't reveal that to John until 39 years later. Logic dictates Paul is not talking about a trumpet that no one knew anything about. Furthermore, the other name for the seventh trumpet in Revelation 10 is the third woe. The first woe, the release of Apollyon and his demons, Second woe, the release of the four evil angels at the Euphrates. Do you really think God would include the rapture in this series of demonic events? I don't think so. The third woe is actually the fall of Satan from the second heaven. To review, contrasting the rapture with the second coming. At the rapture, we meet the Lord in the air. At the second coming, he comes to earth. At the rapture, only believers see him. At the second coming, every eye will see him. At the rapture, he takes the church with him to heaven. At the second coming, he brings the church with him from heaven. At the rapture, he comes to save the church. At the second coming, he comes to save the Jews. After the rapture, the tribulation begins. After the second coming, the millennium begins. And I want to ask you right now, are you ready for the rapture of the church? Have you invited Jesus into your heart to take over your life and be your Lord? If you've never made Jesus the Lord of your life, or if you said, well, I I used to be on fire for Jesus, but I've gotten away, or you say, I'm really not sure, then please, let's give our hearts and dedicate our lives right now to Jesus because You do not want to be left behind. Bow your head and pray with me right now. Dear Lord Jesus, come into my heart. Forgive me of my sin. Wash me and cleanse me. Set me free. Jesus, I believe you died on the cross for me. I believe you're coming back again. Fill me with your Holy Spirit and power. I'm saved because you confess Jesus. I'm born again and I'm on my way to heaven. Now, if you just prayed with me 
call somebody and tell them, I just prayed with that lady. I'm a born-again Christian now. What do we do? How do we walk out our lives? First of all, find a good church where the Bible is believed to be true and the Holy Spirit is honored and go regularly, pray every day, purchase a Bible and start in the New Testament, read it every day and plan to be water baptized to seal your commitment to Christ. The Feast of Trumpets is is unique in that it is on the first day of the month. It's the only one of the seven feasts on the first day of the month. And uh, you have to understand that on the lunar calendar, which the Jews were on, sometimes there were 29 days in a month, sometimes there were 30 days in a month because the lunar cycle is 29.5 days. Therefore, in ancient times, the Feast of Trumpets was called the feast that no man knows the day or the hour. In other words, the Jews knew there was a two-day window when the Feast of Trumpets might be. So the high priest would send, I guess, two members of the Sanhedrin up on a mountain. They would be up there. They would be looking and looking for that sliver of the new moon. And as soon as they would see that little sliver, they would either blow a shofar as a signal to the high priest, or they would start a fire uh, so that when the high priest saw the smoke, then he would sound the shofar, which would then be sounded all over the land. Oh, it's the new year. Happy new year. Uh, But it was called the day that no man knew the day or the hour, because if the Two witnesses didn't see it the first day. They would come down and go back the next day. Now we answer this question. When will the church depart to be with the Lord? If the church departs at the end of a Shemitah year, which is the seventh year of a seven-year cycle, uh, and then the tribulation will immediately begin because the Antichrist is being withheld by us, Then uh, let's put our chart on the screen. The potential years for the Messiah to come, if he's going to come for the church on the Feast of Trumpets after the Shemitah year, would be September 2015 or September 2022 or September 2029 or 2036 or October 2043. Dr. Billy Brim, I'm not saying that I absolutely believe Jesus will come on the year following a Shemitah year or set up his kingdom then, but it could happen. Prophecy is being fulfilled all around us on a daily basis. All right, so the Feast of Trumpets then is the first day in the civil year, and uh, it begins in the fall, and the feast, the feast, next feast is the Feast Day of Atonement, which is 10 days later. And those two feast days together are called the High Holy Days. And so from the Feast of Trumpets through the Day of Atonement are also called the Days of Awe. And the Jews believe that is on the Feast of Trumpets that God writes out what's going to happen in their lives the following year. And they want to be blessed by God. So at that time, they spend a lot of time in prayer, doing good deeds. If maybe they have cheated somebody financially, they like to go and make restitution at that time so that then they know uh, that in the new year, that's their prayer, that God will have good things to say and write in his book that they will have basically a happy new year. And so now uh, the feast, the civil year begins in the fall. The sacred year begins in the spring. And we're talking about here the civil year. Stay tuned and we will be right back.
Teresa's six-part DVD series, What'll I Do? I've Missed the Rapture, is now available for purchase. Teresa gives a detailed account of the seven-year tribulation based on Revelation chapters 6 through 16. She contrasts the burning of Rome midway through the tribulation with the burning of literal Babylon at the end of the tribulation. She also discusses America's role in the tribulation according to George Washington. Also included with this series is the Thanksgiving show entitled Thankful to God and Our Forefathers. She begins this show with a religious persecution of the pilgrims in northern England, their flight to Holland, and ultimately their historic crossing to the New World on the Mayflower. To order this series, what will I do? I've missed the rapture, including the Thanksgiving special, plus the notebook with copies of charts used on the screen, and the pamphlet, Honor the Blood. Send $29 to Teresa Garcia Ministry, P.O. Box 494, Columbia, Illinois, 62236, or call 618-281-3291, or order online at TeresaGarciaMinistry.com. To include a copy of Kirk Cameron's riveting DVD, Monumental, a detailed account of the founding of America for only $10 more, send $39 to Teresa Garcia Ministry, P.O. Box 494, Columbia, Illinois, 62236, or call 618-281-3291, or order online at TeresaGarciaMinistry.com. In Leviticus 23, the Lord gave Moses the holy days that will play out as history unfolds. We are now living in those exciting times when the fall feasts will be fulfilled. The seven feasts of Israel foretell the history of the redemption of the world. Teresa's seven-part DVD series, The Moedim of Jehovah, answers the following questions. Should our day of rest be Saturday or Sunday? Is there rapture in the fall of the year? Why is the bread on Pentecost leavened? And when will Messiah return? Send $36 for Teresa's seven-part series, The Moedim of Jehovah. Also in the series, Teresa makes the case that Jesus was probably born in the fall of the year. She discusses Hanukkah and the Jewish hero Judah Maccabee, who defeated Antiochus Epiphanes, who was a type of the Antichrist. Order The Moedim of Jehovah right now for only $36. Call 618-281-3291 or send $36 to Teresa Garcia Ministry, P.O. Box 494, Columbia, Illinois, 62236 or order online at TeresaGarciaMinistry.com Call now and we'll include free with your order Teresa's teaching on the book of Esther and the ten sons of Haman who are the type for the ten kings who rule with the Antichrist. Remember, call 618-281-3291 and ask for the Moedim of Jehovah for only $36 and we'll also send you absolutely free the teaching on the book of Esther. Next week, we will talk about Yom Kippur and the Feast of Tabernacles. Be sure to join me then. Pray for the peace of Jerusalem, and we will see you again next week. Thank you for watching Understanding the End of the Age with Teresa Garcia. You may contact us at Teresa Garcia Ministry, P.O. Box 494, Columbia, Illinois, 62236, or call 618-281-3291 or visit us online at TeresaGarciaMinistry.com. You may also find us on Facebook and Roku at Teresa Garcia Ministry. For prayer requests, call 618-281-3291 or mail them to us at Teresa Garcia, P.O. Box 494, Columbia, Illinois, 62236. Be sure to join us again next week for Understanding the End of the Age with Teresa Garcia.